This story is Ojibwe Moen, or the Ojibwe language. Binesikwe, Nindijinikaz, Makwa, Indo Dam. Winona Leduc from the White Earth Reservation. The ability to make sounds is a sacred gift from Gijimanadu, or the Great Spirit. It is the essence of identity for all living things. Sounds are used to communicate with each other and the spirit world. The Creator has given the Anishinaabeg Ojibwe a gift. The sounds of our sacred language, Anishinaabe Moen. Say ma. Become. Our language is a gift. It was a gift given to the Anishinaabe by the, by the Creator. It defines us. They talked about it not as language, as we talk about it in English, but as our sound. And I thought that was a wonderful way to do it. When you hear Ojibwe, you can hear how the sound is different, of course, from English. And the way it defines us as a people. When the, an infant was in the uh, in a cradle board, listened to the birds, to the insects, to the animals, to the winds, learning about the world through sound. The child listens. And after anywhere between four and 6,000 hours of listening, the child utters a word. Our words are songs. Our words are prayers. Everything that comes out of our mouth is a prayer because the Great Spirit's listening to us all the time. So we're singing to the heart, to our, our heartbeat when we talk. Stories about our creation have been passed down for centuries in Ojibwe Moen. I think in the beginning of time, when people were created, every group of people has a creation story. And every creation story, there's a philosophy, there's a belief that you're indoctrinated, indoctrinated into believing. And I think the Ojibwe philosophy is so simple because it tells you of your circle, of your beginning, your origin. The creation story starts with the little muskrat diving down, bringing this little piece of dirt up. It's like us going deep down into ourselves to bring, to bring this knowledge out. Kakina <laughs> 
Oningwe Wad. Going and again in Gochi, they be now go soon a key. Me dash ga in and then when a bujo we co yeed. We under wab and gang a key. Me nawa we oje toad or ski a key. Gabayisa ge on den de. Ge in a saba wa or ge in any me go away si yag. Me sa ga pi eje o bash ka se card. Gawain ge go a key or ge gashketo sin on zang te me. Be bejik away si yag or ge go jitu na wa. Ge ga dash ego ni sa ba we wag go jitu wad. Kagwe be tu wad a key. Me dash away bejik or jash ko ge go jitu. O ge an wen me go an indigo o ge ba pi ego. Apa jigo gabe gi o dende. Midash ga pi eje abush kan zikad nebo. Midash oma wawa ninjins. Wena buju ga eje me kang bangi takuna mened oke. Midash oma me kenak o pekwananing. Ga eje atud ake wena buju. Me dash me canak. Ga eje ni menang ni wing o gi bota dan. Me dash ima ga ane onji oje ayag away a ke. Nongum me canako menes ga eje na kateg. When a buju ga eje na gamud. Drakena away siag ni me wag. Mi gwechi wen da mwad owe oshki akhe. Owe unji manetu gagi mi nanang. Gagi kwe gagi gduwen. It is through the language and only through the language that we can get this uh, uh, this brief glimpse of our, of our history. The elders, the teachers, the wisdom keepers of our nation, the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe Anishinaabe nation, have maintained that all creation stories are true. All creation stories are true. The oral tradition is very important for passing down our history. When we talk about history, traditional history, we don't concern ourselves uh, dates or uh, personalities, but teachings. It's something that'll help us to remember what they felt was important, like life. In order to tell a story exactly the way you heard it, that is an art. And that art of oratory is what the Indian people and the Shinabe people had long ago. We did have the uh, sacred scrolls, the birch bark scrolls in a uh, very uh, sophisticated uh, form of uh, pictograph writing. And so there was a uh, very strong oral tradition that was based on the scrolls. The language is part of us. It's our culture, it's our environment. It goes with us wherever we go. Where did we come from? How did we get here? Who am I? You know, who am I? We need to know who you are. Well, Anishinaabe now is just Indian. Ojibwe is referring to the tribe, you know, the Chupwa. Chupwa is more an English misnomer from the word Ojibwe. Mabirg is the first one that ever wrote anything as far as Indian was, and he wrote O T C H I P W E for Chupwa, for Ojibwe. And it ended up, it came out like Chippewa. And Chippewa is just the English version of Ojibwe. That's our tribe. In our ceremonies, we're told, even today, that we came from the East. That our migration story is told in, in frequently. And when we understand Ojibwe, we know what, what's being said. We're told the creation stories frequently also in our ceremony. In the migration from the east to the Great Lakes was, I suspect, the last great period of time 
when the Ojibwe people were whole and when the language was spoken. But a time came then that the people then began to sense something coming. And so uh, there came to the people seven spirits. And they, uh, they delivered to the people seven major prophecies that are still being unfolded and uh, revealed today. It was foretold that there will come across the great salt water in boats and they said uh, those boats will be carrying a light-skinned race of people. That the light-skinned race of people uh, will bring many things. They'll bring many good things. They'll bring many, many bad things. The French arrived in the Great Lakes region seeking the valuable furs and trading with the Ojibwe they encountered. It brought great changes to the Ojibwe people in, in terms of technology available that they had not previously had, like uh, steel, iron and steel, weapons, uh, guns, uh, rifles, um, gunpowder, shot. Those kind of uh, things that kind of ease their lives, steel traps uh, for trapping, but it also changed their lives drastically because it now became an economy based on trade of what, what they had available to trade. Ojibwe Moan became the language of the fur trade for the Europeans and other tribes, such as the Menominee, Winnebago or Ho-Chunk, and Huron. The contact that occurred had to have occurred based on indigenous language or Anishinaabem. Because um, they were the language of power at the time. And so in order for the new people to exist, they had to have a way to communicate. And they had to be able to learn uh, Anishinaabem. And a lot of times that's recorded in, in their own um, documents that they were uh, speakers. Ultimately, the Europeans started using their teaching systems, their teaching styles. They did write uh, uh, Ojibwe dictionaries. In Ojibwe dictionary, they began to introduce their religions, um, along with the religions, um, their rites and rituals that went with those. They wrote their books in Ojibwe, their hymnals, uh, those kind of books, religious books in Ojibwe language. As the British and later the Americans gained power over the region, English became the dominant language for commerce. Within the language embodies the culture, the history, the feelings, the communication, uh, how they relate to one another, the history, the ceremonies, you know, everything, was, everything is tied to the culture. And one of the things that they wanted to do was, again, the government continuously wanted more land, and they had to really dispossess the new people of that land. A lot of times there's a, a misinformation that is given to us when we're going to school, like in history classes, that we were conquered militar militarily. That is not true. You know, the United States government, which is considered to be a powerful nation, at one time tried to do that. But because of the enormous cost of their own uh, lives and economics, that they had to try and find different ways. And, that, and one of the ways they came up with is treaties. The expanding American government sought land from the Ojibwe and negotiated in the English language through paid translators. Mm -hmm. 
sunah beni wikak juga nama tu awa ange. Nuas go ane kena tu magi beni nawa gigi cipta bahu awa. Tuh suku go we beni tu we semua awa tu jenis sunah beruan. In our negotiations with them, the treaties are in English, our language, not their language. We held the, uh, the power when, when we negotiated those treaties in the sense that the treaty negotiators, the interpreters for those treaties were on the federal payroll, the United States payroll. We recorded those treaties in our language, and much of what was said at the treaty negotiations was not actually in the treaties themselves, but was in the proceedings that led up to the treaties. Using this process, the Americans gained millions of acres of land. The Ojibwe received very little. As settlement continued in the Great Lakes region, the United States government stepped up its assault on Ojibwe people with the passage of the Civilization Fund Act of 1819. Language always represented the people, you know, and so one of the ways that they wanted to blend them in was that and they saw that as one of the main obstacles of civilization, of civilizing the Indian people, and so you had to get rid of the, the culture and the language, and so that was targeted right off the bat. In 1887, the government directive came down through the education system. Your attention is called to the regulation of this office, which forbids instruction in schools in any Indian language. The education of Indians in the vernacular is not only of no use to them, but is detrimental to their education and civilization. The purpose of the boarding schools was to um, assimilate Indian children and the assimilation process would eliminate the Indian problem in this country. Indians would not exist anymore. Our language was targeted for extermination through the government and mission boarding schools. Ojibwe children were punished severely for using their language. Many children didn't speak English at all when they got to boarding school, but English was the only language that was allowed. Speak English, speak English. English. Children were disciplined very strongly with, um, with a strap at one school that I, I have heard about. Um, some schools had, um, if you can believe it, um, cells or dungeons where um, a child would be locked for like solitary confinement, removal from your peers, and then kept there for a while to think about what they had done. Well, some of the kids that were sent there, from kindergarten on, they stayed there until they finished that school. So they stayed there year round. They lost everything. I was one of the fortunate ones that was fortunate enough to come home every summer. My grandmother, she couldn't speak any English. We tried to talk the English language like we learned at school. And that lady would say, Kahawin, Bibi Chumokuman, we seen. Speaking their language, I guess the, the people running the school, the people who were disciplining the children, didn't think of it as just speaking your language. I suppose they thought of it as um, just um, rebellion. And perhaps it was. A lot of the children were beaten are speaking their language in these in these boarding schools and I think that when they came back home 
they remembered those teachings <laughs> very well. And they didn't want their children beaten. So they tended not to teach them the traditional language if they didn't know it. They, they, they kept them away from those kinds of things because they didn't want to, they, all Ojibwe people just love their children, okay? And they just don't want to seem hurt. Perhaps if some of our elders did not pass the language or maybe some of the ways on to us, I think that they took a good look at what their own experience had been. And we respect our elders for the wisdom that they have gained through their experience. And I would never question why an elder did not try to teach us to speak our own language or to speak it to us much so that we could learn it naturally. There was such heartbreak associated with school and education and um, with what had happened to them as they were getting this um, Indianness kind of bled out of them that you know all, all I can do is I is just feel the, the compassion that I that I have for for all that they did for us in keeping you know what they did. Besides the prohibition of our language and the boarding school indoctrination of our children, the government passed measures such as the laws for Indian courts, which outlawed many aspects of our traditional culture and spiritual practices. The Anishinaabe language and our spiritual ways went underground. I knew uh, one old, old, old elderly. He tell legends then. He started talking about Wendabushu. What Wendabushu did to begin with, why he kept, kept on going everything that he done. For over 100 years, Ojibwe men and women could be jailed for speaking their language and conducting ceremonies. Several generations passed with families speaking mostly English. Anishinaabe communities have lost many of their fluent speakers. On the Bauman Continuum of Language Viability, Anishinaabe Moen is listed as an endangered indigenous language. It is important to reflect on the past and to decide what to leave behind and what to renew. And it took, um, it took many, many years, many years that we have forgotten the ways that, especially our language that we left behind. And it's gonna take time again if we're ever going to rebuild you know, our Anishinaabe Bimad Dezewin, our Anishinaabe Moen. It's going to take that much time. When we lose our language, we lose our culture, we, we lose our traditions, we lose our ceremonies. How can we conduct our ceremonies to the Great Spirit in a, another language? Anishinaabe <laughs> No, I go the bathroom with the gun and miss the wind and go in the city of Tago to wear a gun or not. Okay, is it what, sir? The Great Spirit gave us a language, they gave us a tradition, they gave us a culture. And if, he, if we talk to him in English, of course, they know. The Lord knows everything. If you wonder, I wonder if he's going to keep that language, or if he's going to be, if he's going to turn over from Anishinaabe to the non-Anishinaabe. Because eventually, if they don't, one of these days a person is going to come to you and say, what are you, uh, nationality? He says, no, no. 
I'm descended from people that call themselves Anishinaabe or Indian people. I am a descendant of one of those. That's what those people are going to say eventually. And we're trying to keep them from saying that. Language is a cornerstone to consider yourself a, a political entity. According to international law, you have to have a language in order for you to consider yourself sovereign. When we do not utilize language in our affairs, in our own independent uh, political affairs, then we have no right to, uh, to say that we're sovereign. It's our responsibility to take care of these things, the things that we were given for the well-being of our people, of our, our babies, of our children, and our families, our parents and aunts and uncles, and elders. And um, that has been forgotten. It's been forgotten, but we're coming back. Uh, you know, people say we're in a resurgence. And I believe that. I can see that people right now, we're being faced with this, uh, this situation where if we don't do anything soon, you look at the past trends of how many elders and fluent speakers and carriers of our traditional knowledge we have lost. Um, if we don't do anything now, it will, it will be gone and we'll be left with maybe this video being left on a shelf somewhere or on a CD-ROM. sort of like a conversion factor, taking ourselves back to believe, to value uh, our language, our identity, and what it can do for us in terms of uh, perpetuating life. Anishinaabe Moen reflects our unique way of seeing and understanding the world. It embodies a philosophy that perpetuates life. Our language is based on uh, uh, orality, relationships. Then each's definition is valued because each's definition is based on experience. And so when you uh, create a dictionary, then that becomes the predominant uh, dictator in how you're going to understand words. It's not based on experience. All the things that we believe philosophically is based on experience. Life is so important for Anishinaabe that each person's definition of their uh, a word, as they understand it, is viable and it's acceptable. Language can be broken up into simply, very, very simply, two categories. Objects that are animate, objects that are inanimate. Kishpin <laughs> I always tell my students, you know, I have a pipe, so the terminology is important here. And do I call myself a pipe owner? Do I own a pipe? I, I don't say that. I cannot declare that. That's like saying, since a pipe is animate, it is a person or a thing, I do not own another person. It's like, it would be the same thing as saying, I, I own a wife. And we don't say that, you know. We don't, we can't own another person. So the, the correct terminology for, for a person that carries a pipe is a pipe carrier. So, <clears throat> very simply, animate and inanimate objects in Ojibwe Moen can explain a lot. Anishinaabemwen indicates that life is the single most valued thing, whereas in, in, in Western language, it's things. William Leap, a linguist of, uh, out of uh, American University, did uh, a major research uh, 
I believe in the 80s, and uh, he found that uh, English language is predominantly made up of uh, nouns, and the, the percentage used was 60% nouns, and uh, Anishinaabemwin is 80% uh, verbs. So there you can see, you know, the different philosophies, and you can extract deep philosophies just knowing those two things. And that's why I'm saying, you know, the Western mind, and I know, because I see it, you all see it. We're all affected by that, because we speak the Western language, and so our values are shaped by that. We begin to acquire um, houses, and we begin to uh, subdivide our lots, and you know, we try to acquire cars, or what have you. Different people have different levels of value to that aspiration. But Anishinaabem, when it's a, it's a language of a process, it's a language of a, a relationship. It's always moving. You can never uh, stop it to say that's it, you know. And so. You can never corner it, and that's the beauty of Anishinaabem. The language is alive. The language, it lives connected to, I think, the traditional environment of Anishinaabe out there at the rice beds. It lives in our ceremonies. It lives at the storytellings when we would sit around for hours. And maybe that storyteller would just keep going and the little kids would fall asleep and they would just keep going and going and going and people would be listening. So it, it's important, I, I think, that we always think of it in terms of that, uh, in terms of its spirituality, because Anishinaabe is a spiritual person. We're spiritual beings, so the language is there for us. That's our vehicle to communicate with Manitouk. And uh, to ask for help, to honor, to give thanks, for healing, for all of these things, all the spiritual nature of everything, of who we are and what is in our environment. Concepts of time is again uh, very unique. It, 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 it is really, uh, we do really have this concept of Indian time, and it's all based on a spatial temporal process where, like uh, the sun, we know. Somehow, we knew for a long, long time that the sun is not real where you seem to see it because I, I think the Western people have discovered like it's eight, eight minutes away from where it was. So that's why, you know, we, we said that the sun was like a being that was always moving. You, it wasn't a thing where you can say, well, it's there. We already knew somehow, supernaturally, that it wasn't there. It just appeared to be there, but it was eight minutes that way. And so that's why it's a process. We can never be arrogant and say it's there. Our language is in structure, is, is made up of prefixes. Then there are your core or your root words. Then there are the suffixes. For example, the word to run, to run to is pato. There are at least 150 prefixes can be affixed to that core word. And so that there are 150 different ways of running. Then there's another word for running from. So when Western people say, you know, like Anishinaabe don't understand concepts of abstraction, you know, that, that's also a lie. We can debunk that if we had time to debunk it because you simply look at some of the uh, uh, geometric designs of uh, traditional embroidery, you know, the beading concept. So that tells us they knew something about the geometric uh, or abstractions. And, and that's why we ourselves, when we begin to lose our language, these things become meaningless. We become nothing more than uh, brown-skinned Western people. You know, thought-wise, we're not different. Skin-wise, maybe we're visible, and of course, that is a barrier unto itself. And so. We have to maintain who we are, who our mothers and fathers wanted us to be. So we have to honor that. And that's honoring your mother is speaking Anishinaabemwin because that's who we are. And we're also bilingual because the relationships we have with Western world, that's our reality. So we have to be bilingual. We have to be bicultural. We have to exist both worlds. But it doesn't mean we have to lose our predominant existence. So that's another example of uh, the beauty of Anishinaabemwin.
As a result of the Civil Rights Movement and other events in the 60s, the Freedom of Religion Act passed, which made it legal for Native Americans to practice their spiritual beliefs and speak their language openly. As well, the Indian Education Act and American Indian Self-Determination Act were passed in the 70s, which finally placed decision-making about our children's education back in the hands of parents. Tribal schools sprang up emphasizing language and culture. Despite more than 200 years of oppression, today Anishinaabe Moan is being taught in both public and tribal schools. It is a difficult process to learn a language if you have only spoken and heard English. These three things are called Ojibwe protocol. My father was the one that kind of coined it. He said, number one, you should know your Indian name. Two, you should know your clan. Three, you should know where you're from. So those very three things, Ojibwe protocol, is what I encourage my students to talk about. <laughs> A lot of the elders now are, are keeping the language going by, by going into the schools when they start assisting the new teachers and uh, also by being there. Rawin wika me wisha a munch da subibu ni neta ngi ke kino maage maage kino maadi ugamigum da ojibwe mung. Nungum Shwingo Nawaj Bata Ninuag Nabaj Niwiwag Gi Kinua Ma Gage Yango Mama Na Gi Anuna Wag Gaying Yuch Anishinabe Magi Kinua Ma Diu Gamigung Da Da Ayawa Da Bizinda Guad Sago Nu Abinujian Anuj Gigu and Dishichigam in Jimin Wenda Guziwad Sago the <laughs> Ojibwe language programs continue to expand in area schools. I think teaching uh, Ojibwe has to be holistic. You have to use as many different experiences as possible and enrich a student's learning with real life experiences, something practical, something that they're going to be able to use. So to provide opportunity for students to have first-hand experience in that. So when people ask me, they say, why, what can I do with Ojibwe language? I would say, well, what can't you do with Ojibwe language? That's the challenge. Most of the situations I see is that uh, students come to my classroom and say, and say, you know, my, my mother never, or father never taught me the language, and so I don't know it, and they feel ashamed about that. Well, they can choose to, to wallow in that and stay with where they are, or they can choose to, uh, to say, look, this is what the situation is, this is how it, what's happened, and my parents never taught me the language, and it's part of being an Anishinaabe. I can choose to stay, stay that and say, poor me, poor me, or they could choose to uh, do something about it. I 
Me tago ni nanu be bunga maji ke kino o magu yan jenita anishena be mo yan. I dash kawin nungum ma nungum ge abe kawin ap jenita anishena be mo si nungum. Sanagad sanagad ta abaje tu yan iyo anishena be mo ni inda sugi je kita sha. In the Sugijic Nimbinda Kuna, Ginkyo Monitog, the way to Kawiwat, Jinatan, Shinabemoyan, the Shigo, get the Zima, Gawing Gae, Gawing Tan, Shinabemo Seawag, and get the Zima, Nisai, Nimse, Gawing Tan, Shinabemo Seawag, Ninetago, Sanagat, Sanagat, Abjig, Abjig was on a good. Mew Angel for Bai, Ian, Mizue. Muja gigo babae ayan ang shinabe wa king je je bisindaw gua ang ginita shinabe mo ni migueche wendam ni migueche wendi mag ingu ingu gikno magic pe ba mi bines to to sana kot kinyo hindi niwag hindi mo ayog akio hindi yog kaya Pochigo Jimmy Quain de Magua and Gil Gekino Omagajig, and a Shinabem one, and a Shinabeje Twawan Gaye. Dash Nongum, Nindanoki Oma, Sugo, Dawa Zaga Iganing, a big King Dasu Igamigo, Oma, Oma Sugo Shkonigani. Minoa Ninga Guajitun. Uh, implement the two yan you uh, language preservation plan is you know, how they get you on my language preservation restoration you got a um, intergenerational I've been with you and suck on a shina been suck you know a nini wag ikwe wag kichi aya ak kakina sugo on a shina abe goma do we do kodadi and jibi ma desi wene gaku on a shina abe moin Ji wani tu si wangu wani shina be mo inkai. Gako medaso bibo naga kingo jigo. Gawin ngi netani shina be mo si yopi. Ngi ge ken danan ni je ke do na ni yopi. Bujo mino amigo ech mibo mine ki ge ken da mani yopi. Nongam dash ni je jinge shina ni ne baya na ni na agoshik. In bawaji ge wani shina be mo. Mino ago, eji eji na naga do enda man gai na kami gak. Kaya gatto go inge kain dano o. Mino ago enji kano do man o kawin niwi daji mi disasin. Mieto go juin do mono go ke juin do mawa gua ni jine shenabe menani. Gish pin gash ke toya ni inje eji chige yan. Bushke a uya wa gash ke to je eji chige it ke iwi. Kaya gatto go da ina kami gak. Itas yo niwi niwi tajin dan ka ka kikinu a mawi wadin gyo kichi a yaak na wajay piti si jig kendo mawadi o jiboy muin anishe na abig no maya anishe na abig o wanenda na wa ja ja aba ja awa do the same aniwa kaya tago api ten dagwa anishe na abig ja aba ja awa do the same aniwa. Kaya gato ko dahil si Chigemin apa na. Anishinaabeg support each other in promoting language preservation and share successful strategies in regional language conferences. Anishinaabe Moentek in Sault Ste. Marie strategically well, brings together and Canadian and U.S. Anishinaabe to share methods, conduct Michigan workshops, network, and renew their commitment to the re-establishment of Ojibwe Moen as their first language. <laughs> also, Anishinaabe we own is an innovative annual gathering of tribal members committed to maintaining the language and promoting its growth throughout the region.
The Ojibwe Language Society is made up of students at the University of Minnesota. We provide a, a community service. The first thing that happens is the first 10, 15 minutes people arrive with food. It's a potluck. And we tease and joke that uh, our motto is we'll, we'll teach for food. And it's, uh, but it's also a traditional thing to do that. Sometimes we get visiting elders and we ask them to do the opening prayer. We have a standard speech that everybody uses all the way around the table. They talk about everything that's personal in their life. And as they come back every week, they, they add to the speech and their, their proficiency develops. <laughs> After that, we break up into little groups and there's a lot, of, lot more one-on-one. -on -one. And we, uh, we, we do little mini lessons, seven to 10 minute lessons. And there's, there's about uh, four language teachers that, uh, that show up pretty regularly at the language table. Now they have places in, in Onigam on Leech Lake and, and La Crudere and Fond du Lac and, and now here they're going to be starting up in Canada also. We run language camps in the summertime. We do uh, language retreats. Immersion camps are available in the summer throughout the Great Lakes region in Canada. Students spend either whole or half days listening and speaking only in Anishinaabe Moi. More and more students are experiencing success in learning the language. Well, what I found is that singing in Ojibwe actually awakens something in the kids. The Ojibwe language is very musical. It's, it's really, it's based in music. Um, for example, the word baka akwe, uh, the word for chicken, I mean, that's, that's music that comes from the chicken. Um, we have speakers who come up with lyrics for the songs, and I actually find a rhythm, and then I take it to the keyboard and come up with a melody that uh, matches the words. Uh, so I, it's not very hard for me to come up with a tune that goes with the words. We only expect maybe, you know, a certain percentage to be near proficient. But if we accomplish that, then that'll be enough to carry it on to the next generation. The Oshka Bevis Journal is, is a publication which is one of a kind in that it's an exclusively Ojibwe language focused publication and has the purpose of preserving language and also the purpose of uh, teaching, sharing stories, and so forth. I asked somebody about Ojibwe language uh, and learning strategies, and they suggested I get involved in transcribing. So I brought along a tape recorder, started recording, and I was amazed as I got into the transcription process how much that involved listening, not, not writing, but listening. You have to back it up and listen to a sentence maybe 10 times to, uh, to be able to get it down on paper correctly, word for word. So I think it's a really good teaching tool, it's a great preservation tool, and judging by the comments of speakers who've had stories in there, it's very well appreciated by the, the speakers and certainly their families. A unique set of comic books that emphasize Ojibwe language and culture have been developed by the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. This approach appeals to young people while providing important education. I've always wanted to do a comic book and kind of give them a history of uh, their tribe and get them to think about what is uh, being lost or what was taken away. And there's a lot of great response uh, from the students in the different schools. It's always good to see that to, to have the students react in, in a positive manner. Two-way instructional television systems provide Anishinaabe Moen to schools that have no teachers. Distance learning technology is becoming common for language programs. Language classes in tribal and community colleges can reach secondary and elementary schools as well. I think it's always good to consider what you're using to teach, um, what different mediums or different tools, computers, CD-ROMs, but we should not forget the traditional aspect of what our language is, that it's a still a spiritual language, and that language 
survives uh, spoken. And the technology is never going to replace that experience of going out with an elder to the rice bed, to knocking rice. We're not using the language that he gave us. We're losing a very, very important part of ourselves how to regain that, and it's only through our children. We have skipped so many generations by loss of our mental well-being, by the loss of our spiritual well-being, by the loss of our emotional well-being and our physical well-being. We are filling up the jails. We are filling up the mental institutions. We are filling up the treatment centers. Our houses are empty, we are out on the street. We need to get back our identity. We have to find our own way in this society. We have to find a way to survive. We have to have our leadership believe that language is the single most important thing. Sometimes the priority has been misplaced. A lot of people put health, economics, and then language. No, it's language first. That's where our health comes from. Without our language, there is no health. You know, there's death. And so that's why we have to truly make believers of everyone that's, you know, Anishinaabe. <laughs> I'm confident that uh, the group of people who are working on it now, the elders who are, who are there all the time, and those soon-to-be elders, and those adults, and families, and the couples who are working hard, and the little kids who have this interest. How do you say this? Can you teach me how to speak in Ojibwe? I think we're gonna be able to do it. We have to be able to do it. Really, there's no choice. We're gonna do it. In the time of the seventh fire, the prophet also said, a young and new, new people shall rise and to retrace the steps to retrieve those things that were abandoned, our language, our traditional spiritual teachings. I believe what we are doing here is a part of it. The new people are here. The seventh fire generation is here. Sky.